Cheers, Jerry. So uh, my name is Alex. I run communications for REI. So we're going to spend about, well, as long as we've got good questions uh, coming, just taking those questions and answering them. Um, the way we're going to do this is, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, then you can raise your hand, and I'll um, pick people as we go. And we have one here. And w I'm going to select people and bring them up to the podium um, when we're ready for that. Um, we've also got a handful of questions that keep coming up through a number of direct um, channels. So we've got an email box to our stewardship email. We have one to the board. And we thought we'd select a couple of those um, just first tougher ones to kick things off. Um, so the first one I'm going to ask is um, about membership sales. So Jerry, uh, the question that come, came in through the box was, there have been some questions around membership being pushed too hard to customers by employees. Um, you said you'd take action. What did you do? When I joined the co-op, one of the things that I discovered, I mean, one, we're proud of our membership. We're proud to talk about the co-op. We're proud and want people to be part members of the co-op. We're passionate about that. Uh, one of the things we discovered, it's, it's a thing you can measure. And we actually had a lot of mechanisms in place to measure that. Um, almost 90% of our sales are to members. Um, you know, and there's no one that has uh, numbers like that. So it's a, it's a fact that we're extremely proud of. We have very loyal members. It's often that, common that we'll uh, have members join us early and really stay through their, through their mid-60s or even beyond that. So that's something in which we're incredibly proud of. What we found, though, is that we were started a trend of staffing according to how effectively we're, we're selling memberships. And the job is bigger than that. The job is really about coming alongside the people that come in our stores, really even servicing the members we have. And so that wasn't a practice that we felt was productive. And over the course of a couple of months, uh, a number of our stores had a different practice in place, had more of a team approach, uh, more about telling and talking about what was amazing about the co-op. You can see us talk a little bit about it tonight. So we've shifted our measures. We've kind of gone away from the practice around uh, staffing according to how we sell memberships and really moved to more of a team measure and really putting much more emphasis on really talking about, about what we love about the co-op. So we have uh, made some, some significant changes there. So there's a second follow-on piece to that question, which has come up a lot in employee forums and e emails, and it's about the $15 minimum wage and about the predictability of hours. And um, people are asking for our perspective on that. So there's been, particularly on the coastal regions, um, Seattle was uh, the forerunner on this, the idea of, of should we move to a $15 an hour wage? And uh, as you move into California, you see the same thing in some of the places in the east. And what you find is that it's become increasingly expensive to live in our major metropolitan areas in the east. And we certainly understand that conversation. We're committed to kind of being compliant with what uh, kind of laws and regulations do get passed. But even more important than that, and we've been doing this for about a year, we've been looking at what it means for AI to play a bigger leadership role here. And we've actually gone out and studied the question about living wage. Uh, what does it mean in different parts of the United States? And explored what it might mean for REI to take a bolder step in that area. Uh, but it's not easy. What we've found is that it, it could cost us upwards of $30 million, and that's about 99% of the profit we made last year. So we're still working on that question. We think there's an opportunity for us to uh, find some space, be more proactive. Um, we're passionate about the subject. We think REI should be a leader in really uh, compensating our, our green vests in a way and all of our hourly employees in a way um, that really, uh, I think, is commensurate with the value they bring to us and our commitment to them. The other thing we're looking at that's equally important is this idea of predictability of hours. Uh, that's something we've actually done some piloting here in this store. Um, we're really kind of taking those learnings to begin to figure out how to push them to the balance of the chain. Um, we do know that we have um, different interests when you come into our store. We have our full-time employees, actually, um, our average mean salary there is, is between about $14.50 an hour, so it's actually pretty high already. Um, and we have a lot of temporary employees that are here for different reasons. So we're also trying to be really sensitive to why people are working at REI and what it is they expect and what they want out of that value proposition. Um, you know, I do know that there's a, a lot of people here with a passion and love for the outdoors, and uh, the whole idea of a yay day, the idea that you can work for 20 hours a week and get insurance coverage. Uh, there's lots of things that we do that we think are really progressive, kind of aligned with our values, but we're continuing to dig in on this subject. Okay, the first question was the gentleman here. Would you be kind enough to take the podium, uh, which is just over yeah. here? Let us know your name and ask the question. Yeah, since, since we're recording, we want, we want uh, it to be able to be recorded, if you would. I hurt my knee. Oh. So... 
Um, this question came actually as I was driving, and I shouldn't admit this too much, but I got a call from Rita, my friend who's a real estate agent in Redmond, and I shouldn't have answered it because I was driving, but nobody's going to tell anybody. <laughs> we won't tell. Okay. Shh. Her and I and her husband and a lot of us joined when we were in high school at Roosevelt in 1966. Uh, we had a great teacher, Dick uh, Smith, who was our biology teacher, who organized us to go out. And he said, the first thing all of you do, take a dollar and go down to REI and become a member. So we all did. That's an amazing story. So, Thank um, In the event, um, she's in, so this is just coming, as you can understand, I'm trying to find parking and I'm doing things that are, you know, I, I usually don't do. And um, she asked, she lives in Redmond with her family and lived there for quite a while, raised two kids. They have a nice salmon stream they're responsible for uh, off of the Sammamish Slough, we used to call it, but it's something else now. Um, so the question is, the Redmond store is leaving. I guess it's going to Bellevue, and I've heard some exciting news just recently, like 20 minutes ago, about the new headquarters. And so are those tied together? Can I tell her it's an optimistic thing that no longer the Redmond store, but a new exciting beginning in Bellevue? You certainly can. The, um, we're going to open, I think, a uh, world-class store in Bellevue. Got an amazing location. Uh, Tim, what's our open date-ish? October-ish. October-ish, okay. So this fall, we should have a store there. Um, I think, you know, we're really, one of the things that I've done that I've, I think the team has done an amazing job on, um, I thought I saw Elizabeth earlier. Um, we, we've kind of been reinventing what does an amazing REI store look like. And you can see when you walk through the flagship here, some of this is one of the labs that we have for experimenting with that. So uh, we're going to put our best foot forward in Bellevue. I think it's going to be an amazing location. Uh, we're very excited about it. Um, and really uh, kind of thrilled to kind of have a presence there in, in such a vibrant community uh, on the east side of Lake Washington. I think the lady's hand here was, off, was up. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you, everybody. I love REI. You did a great job. And I love that opt-out side you did. My niece went from wanting slippers for Christmas to wanting hiking boots. Awesome. Yay. Okay. And so um, as much as I love REI, I was a little bit surprised to see an article in the Seattle Times last fall about the salary that's paid to our wonderful directors. Thank you very much, directors, board of directors, you're great. I, was just, I saw that they get paid, or you get paid, $80,000 a year. Is that correct? That is correct. So, so my question for you is, as a co-op and as a leader and setting the stage and the trends, what I was wondering, if maybe you could take the lowest salary that you pay a full-time employee and come up with some kind of formula that you know, a board of directors should not make more than a certain amount, a percentage amount of the lowest paid employee. And my second um, question would be, could you do the same thing for the executives? I have no idea what you guys make, and I'm sure you're very valuable. But I, I think setting the stage for the corporate world, you guys could, could make such a difference in the world by, by setting that example. I, I appreciate the question. I think it's a great question. And just let me give you a little bit of context. I think, um, and one I'm I inspired by, by your comments, um, what we do there is we really benchmark uh, in, in kind of corporate America and says, what's involved? What, who do we need as board of directors uh, to really run a $2 billion company successful? And we had, um, we had a board meeting today, actually. And in that board meeting, um, we had conversations about what's going on in retail right now. And uh, there's been five bankruptcies announced in the last um, X number of days. And uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, change right now in the retail world. So as we think about who we need, how do we ask people to come and give us uh, many, many days of their lives, uh, be involved, oftentimes a significant amount of travel, um, we are in like the bottom 1% of compensation for directors in the United States. Um, and, you know, we actually, when we looked at it, said our goal, kind of our standards in our charter was to be in the bottom 25%. Uh, we're in the bottom 1%. And even at that rate, we're still in the bottom 1%. So a lot of how we really set compensation, and we do the same thing for hourly employees. We do the same thing for store managers. We do the same thing for merchants. We really look and say, what is, the, what is the competitive rate? We don't 
um, you know, we want people to be able to um, do their life, but be able to do their R and I in a way that they're not uh, paying a tax or an undue benefit associated with for working at REI. So that kind of market adjustment actually towards the bottom, in this instance, the very bottom of that market, is how those are set. So that's, that's how we arrived at it. Um, and um, you know, I have to say that I think we have, I, I've worked with a number of public companies, and I think we have amazing directors uh, that do a great job. So um, I think it's uh, one of the best deals that we get uh, in our business. Thank you for that, exp that explanation. But, I, but my one concern with that is that you're not a corporation. You guys are a co-op. And co-ops should not be measuring themselves against corporations. They're, they're, out of, they're out of line. Those guys are way out of line. So yeah. please don't measure yourself against them. I, I respect the point of view. I think we still have to compete for talent uh, every day. And I think we need and deserve the best talent that we can get. I totally agree with that. Could I ask the board of directors if they would consider working for a forty thousand dollars a year? Would me that be fair? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's the appropriate context for the conversation. So okay, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank for the you. Question. Thank you. Looks like it's a gauntlet trying to get to that thing. <laughs> they put a light right over it, so I can right. only see the light. It's, just <laughs> it's very intimidating. Yeah. Uh, my name is Andy. Uh, I've been working here at REI for 10 years. Uh, for about the last eight years, I've been running the backpack department here, so hopefully some of you guys have enjoyed my services. Um, <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to you guys for uh, some of the stuff that you've already talked on. I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, arguing for us, the employees. Um, yeah, <laughs> I do, uh, and I get plenty of time to talk to my coworkers. Uh, and I, you know, I was kind of on the fence of whether or not I wanted to come up here and talk to you guys and, and challenge you. And every time I brought it up with a coworker, all of them said, "Hey, you should totally do that. We would love to do that. We don't feel like we're in a position that we can do that. All right, we feel like here at REI, we've got this great reputation. Right? We are a great place to work for. We are great to our uh, customers and our members." And it feels to a lot of us like that we are losing some of that. Uh, you know, I remember long ago people would tell me, they'd be like, you know, or I'd say, hey, hey I work for REI. And they say, oh, I hear that's a great place to work for. And I, I used to say, yes, emphatically, it was. Um, you know, even through the 2008 recession when times were tough, this was a great place to be. Uh, but now, you know, my answer to that, and I feel probably a few of my coworkers, or a number of them are going to say their answer is, yeah, that's what people say, right? We have this reputation as being great to our employees, but we here at the Seattle store, a lot of us are not feeling that, right? Similar to what she said, uh, you know, the last two years were incredibly profitable. We made almost $80 million. It was enough money that, you know, not just that our board is making $80,000 a year, but that that went up $34,000 a year. In a year that I didn't get a pay raise, many of my coworkers didn't get a pay raise, we haven't had fully funded retirement in the last, three, four, five years, despite making a good amount of money, right? Enough that I think that we could have afforded to do that. And like she said, you know, yes, we're, you know, we shouldn't be measuring ourselves against others. So Andy, you know, I'm gonna ask, is there a question in there? Yeah, I appreciate sorry. the speech, yeah, okay. but so, the, uh, So, yes, uh, some of it is just me. I want, you, I want to tell you guys how we feel. We love watching this stuff. This is great. I want to know, can we be that company up there Right, that's doing all of these great things, and can we also be good to our coworkers or good to our employees? Can we get fairly compensated? Can we get the signal that we matter too, right? Or that we are, you know, we the ones that face the customers. You're investing in us as much as you're investing in everything else up there. So, Andy, I would I want you to know from me that I care deeply, deeply about the uh, associates that wear a green base and face our customers. I think it is our most um, important asset, it's what really delivers the face of the brand, and I'm very proud of that population of people. I think they, um, you know, I, I gave the numbers a second ago, for us to take our mean salary up to something close to $15 an hour across the country, it costs $30 million. Um, we're looking for that $30 million right now. We've actually been working on this for about a year. We made $30 million last year. We can't operate in the red. We can't put the, the viability of this 77-year-old co-op um, you know, at risk. The, I believe we can get there. 
And I, I think that it requires that we become even better operators than we are today. Um, I think if you look around, um, in the last two and a half years, we've done some things better. Um, and I think it's served the co-op well. And I think we have to continue to do uh, great work and so that we can throw off the kind of money that will allow us um, to compensate you know, our frontline associates the way that we would like to. So I appreciate the sentiment. I have enormous respect uh, for the courage that it took for you to come up and do this. Um, and I have, um, you know, I know that the backpack area is one of the areas that I think we deliver one of our most important uh, experiences to our members. It's one of our heritage core areas uh, that we have a great reputation. So, um, you know, you, can, you need to know from me that this is something that we are working on. Uh, I do want to get there, but I got to do it in a way that doesn't put um, you know, the future of the co-op at risk. And that's what we're, that's, that's the work that we're underway right now. Right. So thank you. Thank you very it. much for the question. <laughs> so I'm going to look for, oh, we have another hand here. Thank you. It's not quite the Oscars, but. Thank you for taking my question. I'm Kate Neville. I'm with Washington Trails Association. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for investing in our organization through corporate sponsorships and Every Trail Connects. And also to thank the REI employees who come out and volunteer with us on trail. Um, many of you take days off of work and come out and help us out. We really appreciate that. Um, we are a membership organization as well, and we share a lot of your mission and vision in protecting public lands, uh, making sure that this stays a vibrant, wonderful place for people to explore. We've got lots of people moving here, and I guess my question is, how can we as nonprofits work with REI so that other companies also see the benefit of supporting nonprofits and follow your great lead in uh, supporting this um, the outdoor resources that we have and making sure that that stays sustainable for the future. Thank you. So Kate, I want to start with just thanking uh, you, your team, uh, the members. Uh, we have an amazing trail network here in the state of Washington, and it's uh, such a pleasure to enjoy those on a regular basis and uh, know how to get there and maybe even what the conditions were the day before. So that's, that's an astonishing service. Um, I think that question of how do we um, really get adequate funding for our public lands to operate? Um, how do we create great experiences for everyone? Is one of the biggest emerging questions that we're gonna face in the outdoor industry. Uh, I know that it's not a question that's just for our, our trails here in the state of Washington, but it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Forest Service or the Park Service. Um, that idea of how do we create um, an, an awareness of the power and the impact of being outdoors and get people to invest in that. So I think, that's a conversation that we're actively involved in. Uh, we're passionate about moving forward. We're committed to uh, stepping up and shouldering our responsibilities there. Um, so I don't have a great answer, but it's a, it's a conversation that uh, with other nonprofits and really the public lands themselves, um, we're trying to get at the heart of it. So I, I appreciate the question. I wish I had a more profound answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna take one. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna go to one from the... Uh one from the board box. Um, so, great growth in the last couple of years. Do we expect to grow at this rate every year? And is the growth sustainable as we professionalize the co-op? Is this about revenue maximization? The, we actually um, have had a lot of conversations about that. And growth is not um, the, at the, really the peak of the objective. It's not how we plan our business. In fact, the last two years, we've planned our business more for a 7% growth. Uh, what we do do is really try to deliver the best experience in our, in our stores and online that we can. And part of that is being in stock. Part of that is understanding when we see demand surge, do we have the product you need when you need it, uh, and then delivering great experiences. So the growth has been more organic than something that we're trying to pursue or drive. Uh, you could argue we've even been backing away from some of the traditional growth drivers. We're not promoting price as much. We're not sitting in um, as much communication around price. Instead, we're talking more about uh, the brand. We're talking more about the outdoors. And we've just seen our engagement level continue to rise. So uh, we continue to plan uh, somewhat modestly, uh, but really pay attention to what is happening in our stores. 
um, and try to uh, live up to the promise of delivering a great experience in our stores uh, and in our online channels. Thank you. We have a hand at the back on the right. Oh, you shouldn't have called on that one. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't, I'm not wearing my glasses. Don't worry, Jerry. This is a softball. <laughs> Dennis Madsen, oh. I am member number 164634. I started working at REI back in 1966, the year you joined. So, so Dennis has stood up here and had to answer questions. I think he should come back up, don't you? <laughs> oh, There's plenty no. of room at the podium. I am in awe of what you all have done over the last two and a half years, and I'm so proud of the resurgence of this co-opness. We're embracing who we, who we are and where we've come from. It hasn't always been that way, though. We have walked a fine line over the decades as those wanted thought we should be more like a co-op and less like a business. And that is a mistake. And I know you get it, that you have to run a business first and foremost, because if you don't run the business well, and you don't generate the profits, the whole thing falls apart. And you can't do all these great things that you're doing today, but it's really delightful to see you investing so much money back into this community, the outdoors. My question for you is, given what's going on out there in the retail environment, and there's a lot of bankruptcies in our sector, what's keeping you up at night? And I'm not looking out 100 years, I'm looking out two, three, four, five years. What is it that's keeping you up that you think could get in the way of us delivering on that 100-year promise? I think that um, there's not enough uh, advocates for the outdoor experience and population centers are, are coming into major metropolitan areas. And uh, more, and more, peop more and more people have not spent a night under the stars. They've just not had that first experience. Uh, one of our, in, you know, Dennis, one of our classes that I, I'm shocked when I got here to learn, we literally teach thousands of adults how to ride a bike. Um, you know, these are, these are men and women that have reached uh, adulthood and don't know how to ride a bike. And, but I love the idea that REI is a place they can go and acquire that skill set, that we can, we can bridge them into that first experience. Uh, I love the idea that we can bridge people into their first night outside under the stars in an outdoor experience. Uh, but that's what, that's what keeps me awake, is how do we continue to take this amazing uh, experience? And I, I, I really appreciate... Um, one of our, our guests last Friday that talked about how we were designed to have nature as a part of our life. Um, and I think that our role, you know, to the extent that we can have a voice uh, that really helps people get motivated to do that is a very powerful idea. But that's what I worry about is um, that people will not have had that experience and will not understand uh, the power, the transformative power of that in their lives. So thank you. Oh, they told, they told, I told them to cut you off after your first question. <laughs> it, I, I think that, you know, one of the things when, when REI gets to the size it is today, um, and one of the issues I'm sure this board is dealing with is development and succession planning. It's so crucial to the seamlessness of, of transitioning from leadership to leadership to leadership. You've brought some great people into this organization from outside, promoted some wonderful people from inside. But what are your thoughts around succession planning and development of your team? And maybe that's more of a question for a board, board member, but just curious. I'm not thinking about going anywhere, but I'll let Cheryl answer the question. <laughs> I wasn't suggesting that you should, but, it, but it's something that needs to be given serious thought strategically from a board level. And it, and it is um, succession, obviously, for Jerry, but then succession of our senior leaders as well. And actually, um, Steve Hooper, who's here, is going to be chairing a, a small group of board members starting to work with uh, Jerry on succession and a succession process with our, with our people, you know, up and down the, the, the line in terms of our management um, and our leadership. We take it quite seriously. We want him to stay. 
Um, I, I remember when I was at Group Health, my board started talking to me about succession, and I had a nervous breakdown. It, actually, it's a good thing, right? You want to get the next level of people and talent ready to go, and we take that quite seriously. Actually, that's the number one job of a board, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I feel uh, we've, we've got some amazing talent in this senior team right now. I would like you know, I would like to take credit for all the great stuff that you've seen in the last two and a half years, but uh, I have been blown away by uh, the work that, to your point, uh, some people have been with the co-op a very long time. Uh, we saw a presentation last night by, I want to call him a young man, he may not be that young, he's worked for the co-op for 20 years, uh, Mark Seidel, I don't know if you know Mark, uh, came to an amazing presentation uh, and just blew us all away. So I think we have some great talent that's been in the organization. And I think some of the people, to your point, that we've added have bring enormous capabilities. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the team. Um, and ironically, we are in a position to attract incredible talent right now. I've been, it's been one of the, of the things that's been interesting. Uh, there is a desire for people to work for a company with purpose. Um, you know, and you know, and I, th I really do respect the two questions we got here around uh, what we're paying our floor associates and, you know, and, and even compensation of senior executives, et cetera. And uh, we are walking that line. And, and if we do our work really well, uh, we'll be able to meet number of needs um, in a way that is consistent with our values. So that's our goal. So thank you for your question. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> There's a hand that's gone up very sharply. Uh, yeah, there we go. Hello, my name's Renee. I love the outdoors. Thank you guys everything you've talked about this evening. A lot of the conversation has been focused on the fact that our population is ever growing. How is REI targeting programs to youth? I always feel like if our national parks were left to today's society, they wouldn't exist. And that makes me sad. <laughs> So what are you doing to get youth outdoors? Can, Jerry, just, one, just one, one comment before Jerry answers fully on the main program. There are a number of nonprofit leaders in the room today whose job it actually is to kind of get folk out and to youth. So I would say if you're here afterwards, take a moment to speak with some of these guys because they're, they're deep experts in that space. But Jerry. Yeah, I think that um, our goals are really and where we've put a lot of investment is to make the outdoors accessible to everybody. And... Um, when we, and there's a journey, there's a process in that journey where I think people start what I call becoming and be deciding who they're going to be and making decisions for themselves. And um, I think one of the things that we're doing increasingly is uh, telling stories and engaging with people in, in an environment that they're in. And, you know, ironically, uh, I, it wasn't so much our intention with Opt Outside, but what we're seeing is when we do this, uh, we do engage a younger audience. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that there were three um, uh, pieces that we did recently. We call it Every Trails Connect. Uh, there was one about a 60-year-old gentleman that's an uh, ultra marathoner, a uh, young woman that was riding across the Arizona, and a third piece about an Appalachian Trail uh, story. There were 40 million views of those pieces. And again, it was really target. It was uh, viewed much more by a younger demographic. So I think we're getting better at speaking to that demographic. More importantly, I think we're uh, probably the most active organization there is, 50 to $60 million over a period of 20, 30 years in building trails and creating access to trails. Um, you know, a lot of the nonprofits that are here, a part of our, our point of view is that local is an incredibly powerful way to get people into the outdoors and to create great outdoor experiences. And nonprofits do an amazing job of being on the ground where um, you know they, there is that opportunity to get people outside. So we've been very, very deliberate about choosing to partner with what we think are kind of the cream of the crop uh, nonprofits to create an environment where uh, we reach out and touch both diverse audiences, younger audiences, uh, and create accessibility. So uh, it's almost one of those things where you can't do enough. It's so important, and and I know that. Uh, my predecessor, Sally, is so passionate about that, and one of the things that we're so proud of is uh, this national park, every fourth grader in there, uh, and even the Conservation Corps, which I think if you noticed, we uh, made a gift to for the national parks, is really bringing young men and women together and creating an experience for them in the parks while they're actually building trails. So 
Um, much of what we do is really focused on that, but I, I have to say it feels very much like you just can't do enough. So I think it's a great question. Share your passion, and um, you know, our commitment is to continue to do as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you for the question. All right, it's getting really warm up here. Either that or we've been going for a long time. I don't We're know. just turning the temperature <laughs> of the lamps up. Good evening. Uh, my name's Hugh Holborn from uh, St. Augustine, Florida. And uh, Welcome to uh, Washington. Well, about six weeks ago when you sent your invitation to come, I said, yeah, I want to go. I want to be there. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to live in New Mexico for about 10 years in Taos and used to go to the REI store in Albuquerque to get whatever gear I needed. Um, and recently, uh, you've opened the store in Jacksonville, Florida, which has been a, a, a big delight for me and my son. Uh, we did a section hike of the Appalachian Trail in September and got all our gear there and awesome. you've got a great guy named Blake in the in the uh, backpacking department by the way they just <laughs> made our experience just absolutely wonderful but um, it's kind of the left side right side of the country thing that I wanted to ask you about because uh, when I said I was going to Seattle to go to the REI members meeting a bunch of my friends said well what the hell's REI <laughs> <clears throat> so I had to explain it to them but I wonder, my question, I guess, is, is how can you help educate? Because I really live in the hinterlands for REI. Um, the feeling I get here amongst the, the people that they've grown up with you. You know, this is a part of their life. Um, but not so in Jacksonville or St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah, I, you know, I, I can relate. I grew up in Oklahoma, and there's still not an REI there. <laughs> and I'm getting calls from my, uh, the people in my hometown there. The, and then I moved to Ohio. There wasn't an REI there. Uh, but I have bought every tent I've ever bought from REI. Uh, so I, one of the things we're doing, and I was going to uh, mention it in a minute, but um, we're, we're preparing to open a new flagship in Washington, D.C. So, you know, we're really excited by the idea of what does it mean for us to put a, a stake in the ground on the East Coast, uh, and what can we learn from that? And my, my sense is that when you have a Seattle flagship experience, it's iconic. And it really creates a place where people get the full experience of what the RAI brand is all about. Um, and I, I, my suspicion is, as we begin to put a few of these flagships, uh, flags in the ground, um, particularly as we think about the East Coast, uh, that'll allow us to tell the story in a more compelling way. Um, I do believe that what we did in Opt Outside uh, was really kind of groundbreaking. Uh, we literally had uh, billions of impressions um, one thing that struck me, and, and we didn't mention it, in our member voting this time, we had members vote from 58 countries around the world. Um, isn't that something? 58 countries. Uh, number two was Canada. Number three was, the United States was number one. Number three was Mexico. And uh, the fourth was Great Britain. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting how we, we've developed a following in many places. So uh, we have a third store we're getting, or a second store we're getting ready to open in Florida. Uh, Tim, when is that one? Uh, soon. soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're opening another store in Florida. I think it's spring. Uh, but the uh, so I I hear you. We we aspire. I have a board of director that has a home in Florida, and he uh, talks to me on a regular basis. <laughs> you know, there he is. Um, yeah, and he has recommendations for how I need to broaden the assortment as well. So. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled you're here. I love that uh, you had an opportunity to get up in the Appalachian Trail and that uh, that was a part of your RI experience as well. Yeah, well, it was a life-changing kind of a thing for my son and I, and REI was a big part of that. And I really uh, just love what you guys do. And there's great heart in this organization, and it's something that more people need to know about. Um, but I do agree your, your flagship store idea is great. I came over here yesterday and went through the store. I had to go across the street and sit down and have an iced tea. And, uh, you know, I was a little overwhelmed <laughs> by the experience. The important question is, did you walk out with a bag? Yeah. I will tonight. Okay, Thank good you deal. For your question. Or before Thank I you. leave town. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
So I think we're coming to the end of the Q&A session. Does anybody have a particularly strong? OK, we have one here. I'm the president-elect of the Washington Ski uh, Touring Club. And we have met here ever since this opened, this building opened. And first of all, I want to thank you so much for hosting us. It's meant a lot to us. And I think a lot of profits have come back to our yeah, because we always shop as we come in. Outstanding. We'll start putting skis out here so we yeah. can get to walk by them. Well, and I just wanted to say, um, you know, keep true to having, you know, uh, the equipment that we need to get out in the mountains. Um, you know, w with the loss of Marmot, now Bellevue really does need an REI. And um, a lot of our, our members um, live in Bellevue, and they're all, you know, we're pretty cheerful, and, and I think they'll be pretty excited. And they really want those skis. They really want that gear to get out in the mountains. So. The, uh, well, thank you. The, uh, it's going to be an amazing store. We've actually spent some time thinking about what does it really mean to be authentic in a powerful way. So it is it's something we'll remain committed to. So um, thank you. And I, again, I appreciate your leadership of an organization that I, I just, this idea of getting people out is so important. So thank you for that. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. The, uh, I hope you feel energized to be a part of the co-op. I truly believe that as a member-led organization, uh, we're making a difference. I think we're telling amazing stories. I think we're touching people's lives. And I believe what we're doing is phenomenally important. Um, I am really looking forward to our flagship in Washington, D.C. We've got enormous energy around that. A little bit concerned about opening a flagship about two or three weeks before a presidential election. It could be just pretty interesting. Um, we're also opening our third distribution center in um, Goodyear, Arizona. Um, really proud of the team. They're building one of the first. Is Rick in here? What's it called? A energy, an energy net neutral, one of the first distribution centers in the United States that's energy net neutral. It's, uh, I've seen pictures of the roof. You can't see the roof because of all of the uh, sun panels that are on it. So it's a pretty amazing story. Um, started the video with the idea about what's for the next 100 years. Um, I asked the question both for REI and for the outdoors. And I believe that the stakes are high. Um, I think we need to think long term, but we need to understand what it means short term as well. How do we keep the co-op vibrant and healthy? How do we adhere to our values, which I think are just as important um, as being um, healthy and successful as we look to the future? Um, and I want to leave you with two questions. Um, how do you want the co-op to show up uh, for the members and in the members' best interest and shape the things that we care about? And the second one is how will you participate in the co-op in new ways? Um, this year, we will be reaching out to find more ways to engage uh, not only um, our, our members but our employees in those two questions uh, and continue to really pursue the idea about how do we make a difference, how do we have a big impact, particularly as we look to the future. So I believe in our ability to make an impact. I think we have. Uh, it's one of the things that I find so inspiring about being a part of the co-op story. So um, thank you. We've had a great year. We'll see you outside.